morning. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here at Keep Indiana Learning. This is part of our Counselor Connect series. This is actually part four of a series. Um, parts one and two are in our on-demand library. Part three is on YouTube change of platform because of change in the way of doing the session. So that's why they're in two different places. We are glad you are here today. Um, normally, Amanda Colhan hosts these events, but she could not be here this morning. So I am Marty Hoofer. I am the Keep Indiana Learning Digital Content Manager, and I am thankful you are here as part of Counselor Connect and Keep Indiana Learning. We are in very good hands today. I've thoroughly enjoyed Stephanie's other sessions. And uh, so she is going to wrap things up for us today. Stephanie is the Director of African American Student and Parent Services in the South Bend Community School Corporation is where um, she is part of, located out of, I guess. So Stephanie, I'm just going to let you take it away. And I'm here at any point that you need me, Stephanie. Awesome. So um, I just want to check in with you, uh, Marty, do you, am I sharing my screen then? Yeah, go right ahead. That, that gives you total control. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And Stephanie, I forgot to say this before we started the recording. I will keep my eyes on the chat. And uh, if we need anything, I'll let you know. Okay, let me get situated with my uh, presentation. I apologize. I was little confused. Oh, sorry about that. Nope. I knew that that's what I was supposed to do, and I just got caught up doing something else. <laughs> we all understand. And we, this is great. We still have people popping in, so I'm letting them in as they arrive. So welcome to those of you just joining us. You haven't missed anything. This session is being recorded, um, but now uh, Stephanie's ready. Feel free to use the chat at any point. If you need anything, I'll be monitoring that for Stephanie. So thank you very much, Stephanie, for your time this morning, and you can take it away. Awesome. I am so happy that all of you have joined us this morning for this fourth and final um, session on culturally responsive social emotional learning. Um, the first session was about the power and purpose of culturally responsive SEL. Then we had some time with Dr. Yvonne Larrier and her culturally cultural and global responsive social emotional learning tool. Um, GC scored. And then the last session, we talked about culturally responsive modifications and just had you guys do some breakout rooms and have some individual conversations. And so this final session is the power and purpose of reflection. And we will have, um, it will take on a similar format as um, our last session. We'll have some, I'll provide some content and then I'll break you off into small groups. You guys will have conversations and then we'll come back for share out. I'm not certain why my stuff's not moving to the next screen. All right, there we go. So today we are going to talk about the power and the purpose of social and emotional um, learning or reflection, actually. Um, we're going to talk more about um, the practitioner considerations. So essentially, um, culturally responsive social emotional learning begins with you. And so what that looks like in a reflective manner, we're going to talk about and review the concept of culturally responsive and sustainable social emotional learning. We're going to do some culturally responsive reflection. Um, we're going to have four ways to make SEL more culturally responsive, the story of two teachers, a video reflection, and then a final uh, motivating video. But as always, before we begin, I want our minds to be present in the space um, to be able to have these conversations. So we're going to do the quick one minute mindfulness video. I want you to let yourself be here in this moment in time. Let go of expectations, of to-do lists, and be here. Be present. Take a big breath in. And on your exhale, sigh it out. Another big breath in. 
exhale, let it go. One more, inhale, fill up. Exhale, side out. Let your mind, your breath, and your awareness of your body start to link up as one as you take this moment for you. Be present in this space. Awesome. So I just want to let you know that those moments are more for me than they are for I want you, you all. Let yourself be. Um, because I'm always really, really nervous before a presentation, but you guys have been a phenomenal audience and I greatly appreciate that. So today we're going to talk more and use more of this tool um, called reflection. And I went through various different definitions of reflection, and this is the one that stuck with me the most. And it's a working definition from the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English. And it states that reflection is the process of engaging the self in attentive, critical, exploratory, and iterative interactions with one's thoughts and actions and their underlying conceptual frame with a view to changing them and with a view on the change itself. So reflection is something that's interactive. It's not just, um, let me just think about this and see how I feel. It really has an intention of process, you know, engaging the self with actions of being attentive, exploring, and thinking about our interactions with our thoughts and their underlying conceptual frame with a purpose or a next step of changing them and changing the view of yourself. And I would say maybe not all the time changing the way you think about yourself, but enhancing those thoughts, feelings, and perceptions that we might have had about previous concepts or ideas. When we think of strengthening our cultural responsiveness, reflection and recognizing your own thoughts and values and beliefs are before you even engage student learning. So when we look around the culture wheel, we look at all of the various different things that make us who we are. And those two concepts or those two ideas or practitioner responses are the things that really come before engaging um, student learning. They are the key factors of allowing us to have culturally responsive and sustainable social emotional learning. There are some key ideas when you're thinking about equity focused or culturally responsive SEL. Washington State SEL, Washington State created this um, social emotional learning implementation brief. And it has three separate sections of action. Um, self-awareness and social, self and social awareness, self and social management, self-efficacy and social engagement. Self and social awareness allows educators to think about or reflect on their cultural worldview and biases and influence their interactions with students and families. It provides opportunities for educators to develop a social, cultural, historical, and equity-focused orientation to their work. So it allows us to really look at what influences have we had in our own lives that have an impact on our own worldview. We all have bias. You know, sometimes when we talk about bias, we think of it as a bad word or, you know, something that's wrong with us. But really bias creates an opportunity for an increased understanding of the world around us. If we understand ourselves, then we create an opportunity to understand the world around us and how we have an impact on certain aspects of how we provide service, and our thoughts and ideas of how we see change. Self and social management provides educators with opportunities to listen deeply to students' life, experiences, and perspectives. Support educators to integrate universal design for learning, cultural, re culturally responsive, and healing or trauma-informed practices. It encourages educators to consider how school policies and practices may be interpreted and implemented differently based on one's identity as no practice is neutral. 
when I think of this concept, you have to excuse me, I have this allergy thing going on and I don't want to start coughing. Um, when we think about this self and social management and the idea of thinking deeply about one's identity and um, how certain policies might have an impact on students, what really kind of hit home for me um, was I heard Dr. Lori Desatel speak one time at um, Indiana School Social Work Conference. And she spoke about how those critical things that trigger individuals who have experienced trauma, which is isolation, um, isolation, isolation and inconsistency. And there was a third one that was important. When we think about our discipline practices, we have a tendency during the time um, when we're disciplining students that we remove them from situations, but we don't really consider how that might have an impact on the way a student responds. Um, when you think about students who have, um, who have been sexually um, molested, when you put them in a room by themselves, when does that sexual molestation have a tendency of happening? Um, it happens in isolation. And so um, when we do things such as that, it kind of creates that image in their mind. So that's why that self and social management and listening deeply and considering how our policies and practices may be interpreted and have an impact on others. And then there is the idea of self-efficacy and social engagement. When you support educators in developing positive, trusting relationships with students whose identities and backgrounds differ from their own. It encourages educators to reflect on how they can offer student opportunities for collective empowerment through social engagement and provides opportunities for educators to collaborate with others as a way to enhance their own growth. So we look at this world and sometimes we live in silos in a way that we want to protect what we have um, as if there's not a, enough resources for everyone all around us. But when we create capacity through social engagement, we create different ways to have um, different ideals at the tables to be able to have an impact in a broader sense than just in our own realm or, or, or state of influence. So those are three key practices to consider um, when in our implementation of culturally responsive SEL. Self and social awareness. How do we think about current things as they are? What is our current worldview? Self and social management. Taking an opportunity to listen deeply to life experiences and be able to consider how certain policies and practices may unintentionally have an impact and then self-efficacy and social engagement, creating an opportunity for a broader worldview to be able to increase the capacity of others by increasing our influence in various different spheres of our experience. So at this time, we are a relatively small group. So I'm gonna ask Marty to break us up into two groups. Um, so that we can have just a few minutes of reflection. And if you want to take some time to um, write down these questions or take a picture of them um, in your groups for 10 minutes, I'd like for you to think about what thoughts, values, and beliefs contribute to your current instructional or service practice? How might they have an impact positively and not or and negatively and where do you see yourself on the spectrum of self and social management self and social engagement self-efficacy and social engagement and which might you think would be the most important so i'm going to ask marty to go ahead and break us up into those groups and then we're going to come back in 10 to 12 minutes um, to have some share out time. You got it. All right, I'll push the button now. Thank Enjoy you. your breakout room.
Thanks, Marty. You got it. I set a timer um, because I missed the button to automatically set a timer on there. So my phone's keeping time and I'll close them in about 10 minutes. Oh, and we just had someone join. So I will put them into room two since it's smaller. Hi there, Stephanie, thank you for joining. We are at the spot where we're in our first breakout room and it just started, so you haven't really missed anything. Um, so you can go ahead, I'll put you in that breakout, uh, in breakout room two and they can catch up. So thanks for joining. Actually, I, I'm gonna put you in room one. There we go. Hey, Marty. Yeah. Tessa um, was trying to join, and I think the link that was sent in the reminder um, was to the other platform. Yeah, so I sent them a link. I, I revised it and sent them a personal email. Um, but let me see. Is it Marty? It, would it come from you? Yeah, I think, uh, or maybe it came from Keep Indiana Learning. I can't remember which account I sent it from. But you may be able... There is some way here in Zoom that you can get the invitation. Oh, let me see. I thought it would. I thought about that too. I forgot. I think it's in participants. Let's see. I don't see it there. It's in here somewhere. I found it. You found it. Perfect. Where mm -hmm. is it? It's in participants. Oh, okay, great. Hopefully they're talking. Last time they were just kind of looking at each other. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to send them a message of the questions. So maybe Thank you. Um, oh, my allergies. They are so miserable. I mean, my eye is like, I mean, it's only one eye that wants uh, to water profusely. I hate watery eyes. And it's like only been this year that I've had that. That's dumb. <laughs> uh. Oh, and here's Tessa, so I'll admit her. Good morning, Tessa. Sorry for the confusion with the link. Um, so glad you made it. We, we're glad you're here. Yeah, thank you. I hope others will receive the updated link so they can join. Yeah, um, as soon as I, I thought I had the original email stopped, and when I saw it went out, that's when I panicked yesterday yeah. and resent the correction, but hopefully it got where it needed to go. Well, I'll just tell you, the one I received this morning still is not the correct one. It is one that takes you to the platform and this yeah. music is playing. So people are either have gone on to something else and, but it is not the correct one. So just, so you might resend it now. Yeah. Good to know. I yeah. will do that right now. Um, well, I guess I won't do it right this second. Let me send these questions to the maybe pause the recording because mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but you know, that's when, when we're assistant superintendents and directors, give them the resources that they need. Um, one thing that we talked about a negative impact is that not one size fits all um, and that we need to be more engaged in the process. 
Um, and we also talked about building our capacity and our understanding. Um, we talked about how, in my case, for example, I'm Hispanic and I'm from Puerto Rico. That doesn't mean that everybody that's from Puerto Rico has the same experiences that I do. So it's understanding that, that just because we have maybe the same background, that doesn't mean that we go through the same experiences too. Um, and the last question, we talked about how all three are equally important. We couldn't pick one that we, we said was the most important because we believe that they go hand in hand. And if we have our social awareness, if we don't have those policies in place, we can be aware of our, our social and our biases. But if we don't have those policies in place, there's nothing that we could really move our work forward. And same thing with social engagement and vice versa with social awareness. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I just want to touch a little bit on that concept of um, mental, mental health is for everyone. So everyone here, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that statement at all. But I want us to kind of process through that one element just a little bit. Um, in thinking of the work that um, you do or we've done or what I've done at the district level and um, just... Um, working with social workers in the building, um, there was um, at a different location an, an incident or a concern where we were working with a family and it happened to be an African-American family. And so the organization that I worked with at the time, we were having conversations about some students were having or some children were having some very um, big behavior concerns. And we recognized that it was centered around the loss of very close family members in a fire. And then I overheard, or we were talking and I can hear the tone of our conversation becoming judgmental. So as an African-American family is like, why won't that mom stop working all the time and take her kid to therapy? Because we feel that mental health could make such a pivotal change with those children, right? So that in itself, can be considered a bias. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that our lens and our perspective on that kind of takes a turn to where we could potentially keep someone from getting the help that they need just because of our approach. And I think that's one of the, the things that's really important as we consider these culturally responsive practices related to social emotional learning is that our perspective, our view, we have to meet people where they're at. It's the same concept that we've learned or you've learned potentially in your, your clinical um, training that we have to meet our clients where they are at and have conversations based on what they feel like the needs are to build the relationship. And that clinical practice, your skill creates an opportunity for them to make that realization, hopefully later down the road. But that can be compared to a lot of the different avenues in our, in our work of trying to give people what we think is important for us. We do recognize that there are certain elements of health and being responsive and, and neglect that we do need to pay attention to. But we also need to consider where our own biases may, may lie as we approach certain aspect of support, aspects of support for other individuals. Anybody like to make a comment or, or suggestion or, or feedback on that? Um, I, I would like to, I was just typing in the chat an excellent points, um, Stephanie, about meeting people where they, you know, where they are, where they arrive, um, and quickly switching over to, and we've all been caught in that space, but just bringing that to our awareness, um, because it can prevent people from receiving the service that they need, because the barrier of judgment and how we might approach something will uh, separate us from that service. So that was excellent, thank you. Anybody else or anything in the chat, um, Marty, before we move on? All right. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen, hopefully successfully. I don't know what I, 
Give me one moment. One thing I probably should remember for next time is I shouldn't work my own tech because I'm not the greatest at it. You're doing great. Obviously, I'm not the greatest at it either with the wrong emails going out. So we're showing grace and patience here. Stephanie, we got this. Awesome. <laughs> is it going? Um, I think what I did is I closed something I should not have closed. So give me one second. I apologize. You're fine. I'm sorry, guys. There it is. All right, thank you for your patience. I can share now. All right, that is not the screen I wanted to give you. <laughs> there we go. It keeps going to the wrong one. Would you like me to share and then? Yes, please. Okay, we can do that. Go to screen, um, slide 10. Slide 10. All right, let me, yes, okay. And there we go. You are welcome. Slide 10, there we go. Oh. Wrong button. This is the right button. There we go. All right, so previously we spoke a little bit about the social emotional learning equity continuum. So how we take access to social emotional learning, we become um, culturally proficient with SEL and then culturally responsive and sustainable social emotional learning. And so in order for us to get to that point, there are um, concepts that we have to consider. So there are four ways, the next slide, that we can support um, or actually our intentionality with SEL, um, representing a range of identities. Uh, we wanna make sure that we engage the student experience. We also have to remember that the I opportunity and the idea of culturally responsive and sustainable SEL has asset-based practices. So what that is, it's similar to strengths space, where we wanna create an opportunity for individuals to understand the value of who and what they are at the moment. Not what we can see them being, but what they already bring to the table. And then building relationships and community is critical and important and an integral part to having culturally responsive and the sustainability of those practices with social emotional learning. These practices actively draw upon and supports the stu uh, spo support students' diverse backgrounds, identities, strengths and challenges as a strategy to create agency, an opportunity for them to learn how to be and make good quality decisions. So how do we create the space for that in the next slide? 
which is the four ways to supporting culturally responsive social emotional learning. Culturally responsive social emotional learning is the affirming and supporting cultural identities and intentionally learning about and integrating knowledge of students, culture, and ident identities into SEL instructional practices to build student skill. So when we think about the concept of elevating student voice, celebrating difference, cultivating community, and the concept of mirrors and windows. So elevating student voice creates an opportunity for leadership expansion. It allows them to be able to develop skills and it is that asset-based practice of creating a space for the skills that they have at the moment to build capacity for the skills that they will need later. So we wanna honor students where they are and we want to use current ideas, concepts and, and current events to be able to encourage that voice. We don't wanna ignore what's going on in the current world in order to avoid conflict. And then we wanna begin the process of good positive discourse. How do we have conversations around difference without feeling like we have to unfriend you on Facebook. We wanna create the opportunity for students to be able to learn how to engage in these conversations in a positive way. And that's with you know, elevating their student voice. Culturally responsive social emotional learning creates the opportunity for us to do that. One example that I can give you is I previously worked for um, a predominantly white institution. And regardless of what your, um, political viewpoint is, this is really not to have a political conversation, is really to just kind of um, identify where um, if you ignore current events, they could become a problem later. The first um, election where Obama won, the campus that I worked on treated it as if there was no election at all, like nothing happened that we just went on from one day to the next and we just woke up and everybody, you know, nothing happened. With intentionality to avoid conflict and not to have those conversations, all of those thoughts, feelings, and emotions kind of swelled into this, this um, tension between students of color on campus and students, which were very few, and other students. The space was never created to have those conversations in a positive way. And so when you ignore those things and not give space, it, it creates this tension, but then it's almost ignoring the historical profoundness of certain things like that. And then when you're a in the or when you're an entity that is encouraging diversity, how do your stakeholders or individuals who are already engaged with your services and practices? take you seriously when you say you want to be inclusive. So it's important in that aspect of elevating student voice is creating the space to have those conversations in a very real way that you don't ignore it. When we came back from the pandemic, we had to find tools to have conversations around concepts of, of difference in every aspect of our world because those things became more prevalent based on who had and who didn't when we had to shut the world down. So it's important when we're creating this space for culturally responsive SEL that we consider the student voice and we build agency in our practices. We also want to celebrate difference. Um, we wanna create a space to where we're not, we're avoiding othering. Um, we don't want to talk about, well, you're different than me or, oh, that's a nice difference. We wanna look more at, wow, that's really unique. I never thought of it that way. And to create a space to be able to celebrate a person's um, difference of opinion, their uniqueness in their thought process and the variance of skills that someone might have. I have always been met with, um, you're not like other black people. And I think at some point that that's considered to be a compliment, but I just wanna let you know that it's not. When you're pointing out things that create an opportunity for a person to be uncomfortable with who and what they are, we have to consider how we're celebrating their difference. Does it, is it really celebrating that difference or is it creating an opportunity for othering? 
We want to cultivate the idea of community. We all need each other. Um, we have to build collective agency and civic empowerment. It's very critical and important in this day and age that we're living in. And the pandemic has really brought out the importance of that in a different way. We have to all learn to survive and live together. It doesn't matter what we think about, you know, well, it matters what we think about, you know, um, other things, but how we bring that to the table, how we have those conversations is increasing, becoming more increasingly important. Because in reality, the pandemic showed us that we need each other to be able to survive. And then how we mirror positive behaviors um, as we are supporting culturally responsive social emotional learning. We host a summer experience. And in that summer experience, um, we've partnered with one of our local agency for Safe Swim. It's a phenomenal program. We love working with this agency. They provide a great service to our students. We had an incident where uh, a certain um, document didn't communicate well with uh, one of the buildings that was hosting the pool, the pool where we were hosting it. And the way the, uh, the representative um, from another agency that wasn't even related to the work we were doing with our community partner, um, yelled and, and screamed at our site coordinator was deplorable. How we respond to each other, kids see that. So we oftentimes have to mirror the cultural responsiveness that we wanna see um, our students take action with. We also provide a window to what difference looks like to all to the rest of our kids. So supporting difference or supporting uniqueness, I even have to correct myself, supporting uniqueness in a way where we're providing positive examples of what those unique personalities, unique ways of thought look like in our classroom or in our service or in our instruction, creates an opportunity for students to be able to see themselves. So four ways to support culturally responsive social emotional learning includes elevating student voice, making sure everybody has an opportunity for voice at the table, celebrating difference, using changing our language from difference to uniqueness so no one feels left out. We wanna make sure that we're cultivating community because collective agency and civic empowerment is becoming more increasingly important in this day and age. And we wanna be a mirror of what we wanna see and a window to what can be. So we're gonna go into a video and another reflective piece, but I wanna um, check with Marty to see if there are any um, questions or comments in the chat. There is nothing in the chat. Awesome. So does anybody have any questions or comments to this point before we go to our video? Awesome. So Marty, you can go to the next slide. And just as a brief introduction to the video, this is a video of Melissa Crum, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, this concept of um, multicultural critical reflective practice and um, how it's had an impact and how she uses that in her work. You can go ahead, Martin. Thank you. I loved my second grade teacher. One day it was picture day and I completely forgot. She grabbed a comb and decided to attempt her Coretta Scott Kingish bouffant comb back thing, <laughs> this side swoop. One day I was particularly ornery and she grabbed my wrist and said, Melissa, you are not being your best. And I was angry. She grabbed my hand. I was gonna tell my mama. <laughs> I was seething in my seat. She saw me. She called me outside, gave me a cupcake and said, I'm sorry for grabbing your wrist, but you were not being your best. Sit out here, eat this cupcake, and join us when you're ready. 
Fast forward to eighth grade, and I'm sitting in my math class. My teacher comes over and gently places her hand on my shoulder. And she says to me, you're pretty smart for a black girl. And I remember responding, thank you? <laughs> Unsure what to do with that comment and those emotions that came with it, I went to my principal, who I had a rapport with, and I told him what happened. He sat back in his chair, he sighed, and he said, I'll handle it. A few days later, I was in class, and she came to me with this confused face. And she said, I'm sorry if I offended you with what I said, but I just wanted you to know that I think you're smart. And it was clear to me that she was completely unaware of how problematic her statement was, how it made me feel. A few days later, I go to my English class where we had the results of a test that told us what reading level we were at, what grade we were reading. So in eighth grade, I was reading at an 11th grade level. Jerry, a white boy who was sitting next to me, his test said he was reading at a 12th grade level. And I remember thinking, that must be what she means. Fast forward, my son is getting prepared to enter kindergarten, and I have a lot of anxiety around it. I wondered, how do I go about putting my son in a space to limit these types of biases, these types of interactions with teachers. So I worked with some parents to create a homeschool cooperative where we use the information and the knowledge of the group and the resources in the community to teach our children. We started off with two African American families. We blossomed to seven, then 14 children. And more people continued to inquire about what we're doing and asking us how to be a part. Then I began to wonder, why did they want to be in a cooperative in the first place? What was the impetus that made them want to move their children from traditional schools? So I asked the parents. Then I asked African American families who were homeschooling across the nation. One thing remained consistent. Every family who decided to homeschool their children either had a negative interaction with the teacher when they were students or a negative interaction with the teacher from their children. So what we find, research tells us that teachers' histories are important when it comes to the classroom. They bring those stories that guide how they choose curriculum, how they choose to teach, and how they interact with their students. What we also know is that we have to be careful about how we interact with our children and how we think about the work that we're doing with them. So I began to wonder, how do those microscopic interactions with teachers that have that underlying bias, how might that be replicated or manifest in macroscopic situations? How might these interactions be supported in state and federal policies that affect education? So we know that African-American children, particularly boys, are dis disproportionately disciplined. They're giving more suspensions than their white counterparts for the same infractions. We know that African-American children are disproportionately placed in special education. They're also disproportionately medicated in the school system. We also know that states like Alabama, Virginia, and my home state of Florida has race-based academic standards. Let that sit for a moment. Race-based academic standards. So what that means is a white child may be required to pass at 80%, where a black child is required to pass at 60. So what does that mean for our children? Who are we telling who can and can't be intelligent? How are we preparing our children for the next grade, for college? I then began to look at teacher demographics and student demographics. So I looked at how, who's in this classroom, right? So we know that children of color have doubled in the last 30 years in the K-12 system. We know that 22% 
of children live in poverty. And we know that 10% of students in the K through 12 system are English language learners. Yet, our teacher workforce remains predominantly female, white, middle class, and monolingual English speakers. We also know that there's challenges around retention in urban and rural areas where this diversity is most concentrated. So universities and teacher preparation programs have recognized this. And they've created diversity training programs, which generally are categorized in three different categories. First, it's conservative, in which teachers are told that children should be assimilating into mainstream norms and removing any cultural differences. Liberal, which tells teachers to tolerate difference. And third, and the least utilized, is critical. Critical requires teachers to investigate the influences of power, oppression, dominance, and inequity that manifests in the classroom and extends into federal policies. So who's doing this? Who's able to think about these large macroscopic issues and make them relatable and digestible to a lay audience? Artists and museum educators. I argue that when we incorporate art, critical self-reflection, storytelling, and peer dialogue into professional development, we prepare teachers to be better leaders as they reflect on their own biases that they bring into the classroom. That increases their engagement and strong relationships with their students and have higher academic achievement in the classroom. So let's take this image. I ask teachers, what do you see? Oftentimes they say, I see two black male figures, maybe two friends, maybe a father and son. Then I say, tell me a little bit about them. Who are they? I get a myriad of stories, but I always get something isn't right here. Something's wrong. They're up to something. They're violent. Then I say, what do you see that makes you say that? And oftentimes they can't put their finger on what exactly they see, what exactly evoked that emotion. But as we go through this inquiry-based process, what those teachers tend to find is that they have deep-seated stories about who these black boys are or aren't. In the same way they brought those stories to this painting, they bring those stories to those boys that show up in their classes. Critically conscious museum educators are experts at having this inquiry-based interaction. They're great at having this dialogue around images that, have, that encompass these large issues. They're able to create engaging and participatory activities that make the complex simple. They can harness that learning power within museums and they can do it within an hour. My colleague, Kiona Hendrick and I, created a process called Multicultural Critical Reflective Practice. It's an ongoing process that asks teachers to identify, analyze, and challenge those cultural beliefs, values, and assumptions that color their interactions with their students. It can't be boxed. It's a blend of different approaches. We ask these teachers to confront their preconceived notions that guide their relationships with their students. It's an uncomfortable session. We bring up these emotions and these deep-seated stories that they didn't realize they had. We evoke emotions for change we believe when you feel it, you can identify it, you have something to hold on to, something you can change. So what happens when we incorporate the works of Emory Douglas or Kehinde Wiley or Micheline Thomas or Titus Kafor or Wanjechi Mutu? What happens when we get these images to ask people, to ask our teachers, to dig into the deep recesses of their minds and harness those problematic concepts that they've been socialized and been, and been told to internalize. 
where we found that it's working. As we're doing this work across the country with educators, they're better prepared to have conversations around race, sexuality, gender, cultural differences. Professors are better equipped to teach their teachers to have these engaging and conscious interactions with their, with their students. And K through 12 teachers more conscious about their curriculum choices and their interactions with their students. So what happens? We know when we engage students, we lessen dropout rates. We increase academic performance. When we have a more intellectual workforce, we know that we have more productive citizens. So what happens when we ask social workers, nonprofit leaders, police officers to do this critical self-reflection, to ask them to critically think about the communities they've been charged to help, support, and protect? Maybe we get people like my second grade teacher. Ms. Whitehurst, I don't know where you are right now, but I thank you. I thank you for telling me to be my best and expecting nothing less. I thank you for seeing my humanness and complexity. I thank you for helping me see and believe in what you saw in me. Thank you. You're on mute, Stephanie. Thank you, Marty, uh, for sharing that. I want us to spend um, some additional reflection time. Um, in the reflection, you can go to the next screen. All right, so we're going to do, um, I would probably say three breakout rooms. So we have smaller groups. Um, we're gonna spend about 10 minutes conversing about the video. The items I'd like for you to consider is what's one word or statement that made you think um, that she shared in her video? Um, in what ways have your biases shown up with students or with the, the individuals you serve, what's your level of comfort with discussing this topic? Because the discomfort is good, so don't shy away from that discomfort. And then what is the potential impact of reflection? She spoke a little bit about using multicultural critical, critical reflective practices to assist with the development of um, cultural responsive skills. So how might this concept or framework have an impact? So Marty's gonna split us into the three groups. And I'm gonna ask that you um, engage in conversation around these concepts. Um, it might be 10 minutes, it might be a little more, and then we're gonna come back and share out and have a closing. I'm clicking the buttons, give me just a second. All right, they are moving in. Thank you, Marty. You are welcome. I will send the um, questions 
to the rooms. And we do have some things in the chat, but I didn't bring it up because I knew you wanted them to reflect in the breakout rooms. So if those Let's things don't, back. Yeah, yeah, if those things don't come up, then I'll go back to them. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Oh, and remember to turn off the cord. Create a space for you to be able to um, start the process of understanding yourself so that you can create this interest in others around being culturally responsive with your social emotional learning um, techniques or curriculum. When you think about it, there is no packaged curriculum or <clears throat> packaged uh, ABC checklist that will make what you're, to get to what you're looking for. I think um, when, we, when we think about the title of culturally responsive social emotional learning, we think that there's something there. Um, it's kind of like in the same concept as as we talk about adverse childhood experiences and building resilience. We think that there's a form formula to address that, but really at the center of the formula is you. And so this last session was to create an opportunity for you to kind of think through, you know, where am I on that spectrum of access, proficiency, and sustainability so that I can be an influence in my world of work to be able to create the space for culturally responsive and sustainable social emotional learning. So thank you again for your time. Um, I hope you were able to get something out of the four part series and um, I would be happy to entertain any questions. I'm hoping to come back um, in the fall to kind of um, talk through that concept of um, micro exclusions. I'm doing some more digging on that because I want to make sure it's a new concept to me. I want to make sure that when I um, provide any content on that, I I'm doing it justice. So thank you again for your time. It is hump day. And so I think the weather is going to be better. It's getting better. Uh, so enjoy some time in the sun and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We appreciate you. I'm already looking forward um, to you coming back in the fall. Your sessions have been great. Um, sessions one and two are in our on-demand platform, so you can see those at Keep Indiana Learning, free registration, putting your name, email address, and you're good to go. Um, session three is available on YouTube, and then this one will be there as well, so you can re-watch um, anything you might have missed. And Stephanie, I'll uh, I do have a question for you about the slides, so we'll we'll talk about that in just a bit. But um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being a part of our session today. I have put in the chat the link for the PGPs and the CEUs, so if you need those, you can click on that link, and um, our Counselor Connect consultant, Amanda Colhan, takes care of those, so you'll be receiving your CEUs and your PGPs in the coming days from her. So thank you very much, Stephanie. Thanks to all of you for being here today, and have a great Wednesday afternoon. Bye-bye.